Hello and welcome to episode 46 of the Mental Health Gaming Podcast. I'm Bradley and once again I think he's out of the cyberpunk world for a bit um, to talk to us. It's Stu. Hello. Yeah. Is this the real world? Is this is this life? Is this reality? Whatever it is, the, the lyrics. Uh, <laughs> it's just fantasy. It is just fantasy. Yeah. Now actually, funnily, I've not long uh, come out of VR, which is even more immersive. So we can talk about that in a minute. You talk about VR like I talk about Tetris. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I am an evangelist. Yeah, praise the Lord. That's Dark Souls. Is it? No, that's praise um, the fire, That's isn't praise it? the sun. Oh, praise the sun. There we go. There you go. I'm mixing up my analogies. Yeah. It all just melds into one. It does. Shows how much it's got into the consciousness, though, because I've never even played the game properly, and I still know the praise the sun thing. Whereas I have played it, and I don't. <laughs> but that's ADHD. We'll blame the ADHD. <laughs> oh, a flower. Yeah, there's a rabbit usually, mm. but there you go. Oh, right. okay. Uh, as I'm sitting there, I'm saying that I'm doing that, and I'm sort of talking, trying to focus, and I'm sitting here playing with the edges of my mouse mat, um, just because they, they, they were they, honestly, it wasn't perfectly straight along the edge of my desk. And so I went, oh, hang on, this 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 won't do. I'm not obsessive compulsive, but I just went, oh, that's not straight, and I just spent literally about thirty seconds. While talking, focusing, going, yep, yeah, that's there now. And now my keyboard's... There we go. That way. Everything's where it should Excellent. be now. It's all nice. <laughs> well, things have to be aligned, otherwise it's never any good. So yeah, Not not usually during a live recording. <laughs> well, you're, you're very good at doing a juggling act with it all. You're yeah. a multitasker. But it's the main reason when they done that actual live version of VR in the States, they didn't invite me along to be part of it because I just couldn't keep it going. I kept getting distracted during the live takes. Oh, was that the one? The only reason was it? Yeah. yeah well, that and I was probably about twelve and never been to America. Couple, um, only a couple of small barriers in the way. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I knew George Clooney was then, like everyone else. And the only reason I know who Noah Wiley is as well, he's done loads of stuff, but everyone only knows. Oh, he's that guy in ER who was sidekick to Doctor Doug Ross. But there you go. Anyway, That's right. side sidekick bloke. Anyway, yeah. Video games. What have you been playing, Stu? <laughs> <laughs> Two things mainly. So, well, there was something else I want to talk about as well, but we'll start off with the games I've played. So, I've been playing Dead Cells at last. Mm. I'd it came it came sort of free on Game Pass just after I'd finished Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. So, I wasn't in the mood to just dive straight into another Metroidvania style experience. So, I knew it was going to be great, but I thought oh, I'll give it a give it a bit of rest and then come back fresh. Uh, and I did. So, I'm playing it on my GPD. XD, so you know, on the little handheld thing, um, which is a great way to play it. Uh, so I'm guessing, like people who are playing it on Switch, have noticed this as well. That it's one of those games ideally suited for a handheld. Yeah. And to to go off into another layer of distraction and going off the point a little, um, I found that with the Castlevania games, I always seem to enjoy them the most. Sort of dipping in and out, playing them on the on the Game Boy Advance and the DS and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, so. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, Dead Cells is really good, as I'm sure everybody already knows, as it's been out for years and years and years. Yes, but it is. Yeah, yeah, it's really excellent. Um, what I think it does really well is just the pace. It seems to keep the pace up and allows you to make a decent amount of progress before becoming a bit too punitive. And I think, you know, it's very difficult with the roguelite and roguelite things to do that sometimes. They seem to yeah. get the balance you know, a little wrong. Either it's you progress too far and then if you die, you've lost an absolute ton of stuff or you hardly get anywhere at all and that's unsatisfying. So it seems to have the balance right. Uh, it looks gorgeous and, yeah, just it's a really enjoyable, zippy, arcadey experience even though it's a roguelike. Yeah, it's a... Um, the balance in that game is absolutely wonderful. I, I've played numerous hours still not completed it but don't care because i just enjoy going through like just the opening few levels time and time again i think that's the sign of a good roguelike in all fairness and um yeah yeah it's just it's got the balance absolutely spot on i don't think i've ever played it got back died gone back to the beginning oh i've got to go through that section again um it's like okay yeah no i'll go again what can i do this time what 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 you know what weapons can i get what powers can i get what can i upgrade how's it going to make it a different approach 
and even though it's obviously it's procedurally generated and the levels are different every time it seems to be using i would say tiles so you go through it and you recognize bits that you've done before uh, they might be in slightly different orders or laid out slightly differently, but you recognise it. So it's not like, oh, we've just got a template of assets and we'll just throw them at the screen and see what sticks. It actually seems to be a well-designed tile template that keeps it all together. So you don't get that frustration of having to completely relearn everything every time you go in. So there is that element of right, I know what this is and I know how I'm going to approach this and where the enemies might be and how I can then change my approach. So you actually do learn rather than just hope you upgrade well enough. It's, it, yeah, absolutely wonderful yeah. game. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. You know, it's something that the balance is off it in some of the games, but definitely not here, that, you know, if you have it balanced correctly, then every time you re-experience it is a joy you know and engaging and it's something that you know that if you're going to do it right you have to put a hell of a lot of effort in because as i've mentioned before on the podcast like arcade games of old they were actually only like half an hour long yeah. but you you they were so difficult that you were redoing bits over and over again at the start so it had to be good at the start and then the design had to be good enough to carry it through so that you didn't get bored but with roguelites, it's even more uh, kind of the spotlights on it even more because, yeah, it's it's going to be very similar each t visually each time you play it. So yeah. it has to be mechanically great and also you know just enjoyable and gorgeous. So it does that like Hades does it, uh, yes. but not you know not quite as well because what you know not much comes close to Hades to be fair. Um, yeah, I, I mean I would say if you're talking about Hades as absolute on its own legend here then I would say next tier down, that is Dead Cells is probably topping that, along with Binding of Isaac, I would say. Um, yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. So I've got another game to talk about. I was, there's two things before I was going to do. You, One before, gonna... you, before you do, um, yeah. you, you spoke about um, at the end that how games have improved, because like in the old days of the arcades where it was like half hour long games that just took ages because they were hard. And now how games have got to be clever with how they elongate things or make you keep your interest longer. A couple of them I've been playing that I was going to touch on is two Souls-like games that I've been playing. One is called um, Morbid the Se Seven Acolytes and the other one is called uh, Kronos Before the Ashes. Um, and you've got two extremes on how to do a Souls-like when you're not actually Dark Souls. Ooh. So Morbid Seven Acolytes is it's got all the trappings of a Souls-like. So you go through hard enemies, you, you find a campfire or shrine in this case, and it resets the world. There's big bosses that you need to take on, and obviously you can you can upgrade as you level up and stuff like that no actual going to collecting your souls after you die though which is interesting mm, strange and it's a 2d isometric type thing that moves it's kind of it's not like free control it's almost like the eight ways con uh, is it eight it was eight wasn't it back in the day eight directions yeah. yeah it's almost that but not quite at the same time a bit more fluid than that it's a really weird really weird one but it works for what it is uh, but it's really interesting, not without its faults, but it is an interesting game. And there's a video up on um, our YouTube channel for that one. And there'll be a the YouTube one coming for Kronos um, before the ashes. Now, this is an example of how not to make a Souls like. When I play the Dark Souls games and when I've played Bloodborne as well, one of the things I like about them is they are very well segmented. You can play them in like half hour chunks and you go from like say bonfire to bonfire and that's it, you're done for a week maybe or you or you might continue, it's up to you, but you can do that and it will throw at you a good balance of enemies. From the start, there's enemies to take on, fairly simple enemies eventually, but it gives you enemies right from the very first moment. So you're, you're taken straight into the action, uh, albeit after long cutscenes or, or, or whatever. And I like that. And... Even if you leave it for a few months and you go back, because of how it's segmented in such a way, despite being an open world of sorts, you might screw up first couple of times you get used to the controls and then fight, you just go back and you can just like, look, now I'm used to it again and you go, you don't lose anything. Constant, constant filling you with 
I don't want to say action because it's not action orientated, but there's constant stuff going on. Kronos commits the cardinal sin of I was half hour into the game and I hadn't encountered an enemy yet and I was bored. Wow. Yeah. I did not care about the character. Um, I did not care about the story so much. So that there was a story, there was a cutscene. I was like semi-interested. And by the time I finished, got to the point where I first got to take on an enemy, I was like, why do I care about this character again? Why do I want to keep him alive? Um, you've got this young boy in what looks like it's set in this almost Dark Souls-style gothic world. And he's got this really basic sword and a cheap wooden shield, which is all fine. But then the game actually gives you control and you're in like 1963 on this overworld thing. There's like computer, like basic computer technology. There's these ironwork stairs and it's all kind of mixed with this like gothic overtone and stuff like that. And totally, it just doesn't make sense. It's, I'm not going to accuse them of just going, hey, we bought a few different asset packs and we've merged them together because more's got into it than that. But why is this young boy, when 1963 there's certain technologies around, you know, why are they sending him out to go and defeat these um, other world enemies with just a wooden shield and a sword? It does not make sense when they've got all the materials to give him more than what he actually needs. And I spent most of my time going, and again, this could be my ADHD, going, well, why, why is he doing this? Why, why has he got a wooden shield? Look at all the metal around. Why not craft him something already? For, there's no reason why he's got this basic stuff when he lives in a world where there are computers and the things like that. And I get he's going into portals to go into other worlds. But even then, they don't seem overly that far back that he can't have a decent weapon to go in with. You know, there's reason. When you look at it in Dark Souls, there's reasons for it. It works. In Morbid, even though the game's, you know, it's, I would say it's just above average. It's a decent game. You woke up shipwrecked with nothing. So there's a reason for it. You're the last surviving human, so it appears at the time. So there's a reason for it. This, you're part of a cult. And there's loads of people around. You see the technologies there. And it just, it just does not make sense. Um, and yeah, it commits the ultimate yeah. sin of just being boring. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, you know me, I don't like crapping on games. I, I'll find the best in any of them. But yeah, it was dull and boring. I didn't care and it didn't make sense. So that's not how you do a Dark Souls game. Wow. Yeah. That's missing the mark quite considerably, isn't it? Yes. Um, and I did check to make sure it wasn't just me. And yeah, it got it gets mixed reviews on Steam as well. So it wasn't just me not getting the point. I think other people have seen it that way as well. Certainly sounds like it. Yeah. Anyway, back over to you. I interrupted. Yeah. No. 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 That was the right the right thing to do. No. The only thing that came to me this week as well was that we rarely talk about anything that we've sort of abandoned. Mm. And I, I with games, I tend to I either kind of know from the start that I'm not going to like them and then just ditch them, or I tend to just see it through, even if they're not amazing. But I gave up on River City Girls um, 60% through or more, yeah. uh, which is unusual for me. And it's just because it, it, I got really, again, bored, like really frustrated. Because it's got a thing where <clears throat> if you, when you get hit, you you can't escape from it. So you, you have to eat their entire combo. Um, and this is uh, this is called a stun lock. And you get stun locked, but in most brawlers, you have a special move that gets you out of it at the cost of some health. Yeah. But normally less less health than you would take from just taking the beating. And it's uh, it's kind of like a universal mechanic of it. Um, much like Tetris rotating blocks, and that's gone to all the other puzzle games of its ilk, rather than, I don't know, them smashing apart and, you know, reappearing somewhere else or something. Yeah. So it's kind of there for a reason because it makes sense to people. So for that to have gone is there's no there's no alternative for it. There's a block, but the block only works in the direction that you're facing. So if you're getting attacked by multiple enemies, you either if you do, if you can't get out the counter attack, the rear attack in time to get rid of them, and there isn't a dedicated button. It's a you know it's a combo. Um, then you're screwed because you're getting hit from behind. So you can't block properly and you can't use a special move escape. So, yes, after a while of going back to the same areas, because it's a kind of hub world thing, and getting into lots of fights where 
I am feeling like it's unfair that, that the way that I'm getting battered around. I just got it, gave up with it because it was just too frustrating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and to be honest, I mean, I know a lot of people love River City Girls. Um, I, I I gave it a brief go, and I just I'm glad I didn't buy it from the time I got to play it. And yeah, it's it's. It's okay, I suppose, but like, like with, I think, a lot of games, and I think something we'll cover a little bit later, it's okay not to like something as well um, for any number of reasons, and if it's one you just didn't get on with because it changes up a core mechanic that you, I don't want to say rely on, but um, felt a vital part of the game, then so be it, and something that I think often doesn't get spoke about enough is that it's okay to abandon games. Um, it's, there's yeah. no shame yeah. in it whatsoever. If you need to abandon a game, abandon a game. Yeah, I'd wrung all the enjoyment from it that I possibly could with that mechanic in place that, to me, felt like it was uh, it was just jank, it felt like. I, I can see what, what they were going for. You know, they're trying to mix it up and make it different and make it make you more vulnerable because they're trying to make it a longer experience and, and a, a wider yeah. one. But, so, yeah, for me, it didn't work. Was it a purchase or a Game Pass game? Game Pass. Again, that's yeah. ideal what Game Pass is for because yeah. you're okay having played, would you say, about 60% of the game. Yeah, that works. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's perfect for that. Otherwise, you, you know you've either got buyer's regret and you won't try another one in the future or you're just like, right, well, no, I've got to get my 23, 25 quid's worth out of this. I've got to get... And that's when you stop abandoning games. But this, you gave it a go, didn't like it, and so be it. At least you gave it a go and someone yeah. got a play out of it and it's got them exposure. Um, exactly, yeah. So, yeah. Their good. engagement... Re- yeah, yeah. Their engagement rate goes up, so it's good for, for the developers. and Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. But um, one thing that I did like and I'm enjoying is Asgard's Wrath in VR. Now, uh, this is a real biggie. There's a there's a handful of VR games that are sort of really pushing things forward and they're the kind of the exemplars of the format and they're what people are really on board for. Well, that's debatable, but we'll come back to it. But um, it, when people moan about not having larger experiences that are similar to what you get in the in, you know, the regular gaming world, uh, it's one of the answers to that. So it's alongside sort of Half-Life Alex and The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners and Boneworks, where they're doing something um, very, very deep, you know. Yeah. And what it does, I didn't realise it was going to do this. Um, I thought it was just going to be like, basically God of War but in VR which to be fair would be quite impressive anyway but it isn't at all so you start off as a god and you're seeing all these um, things happen these battles going on between sort of titans and little human beings very reminiscent of like Clash of the Titans and you know all those Ray Harryhausen sort of things and you start to get involved and get into battles and then it changes so that you can take a human form. So you are part of the, like, you're like a demigod um, who's in human form, who's just been brought to Earth. Well, not Earth, Asgard first and Midgard later. And yeah, so basically you, you have to, you're trying to increase your godly powers. And I don't know what the wider sort of bigger in, uh, incentive or storyline's going to be yet but it's uh, so far just consolidating your power and Loki is the is the guy guiding you to be uh, a bigger and more powerful god which is a bit concerning knowing Loki's character Loki's the best though in all fairness we all want to be he Loki is. yeah 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 he is very cool and um, so yeah so it, so far I'm switching between uh, being like a human being and moving around and solving mechanical puzzles and then going into like god form to have a bigger look at the environment and i have not like so far had to do anything particularly exciting as a god but it is nice to be able to get that zoomed out view and manipulate objects so there's the first thing that you do is so you're going along and doing all sort of god of war slash third person or first person action adventure style stuff and then it teaches you that you can go into god mode and there's a shark in in the ocean 
at the beach where you land and you can you transform it into a sort of land shark like a, a warrior shark who can walk on on land like a hybrid and he's like your companion then and you can command him to do stuff and he can battle for you and he can help you solve puzzles so it's got that sort of switch mechanic a little bit similar to like Resident Evil Zero where yeah. you can zap between you and, and do things but uh, yeah so so far it's really excellent and to, like that's all very immersive and it's also gorgeous it's really good looking game and you know it's kind of it's not not really quite on the level of Half-Life Alex because little is but it's really good looking you know it's like a top tier last gen game so you know Last of Us quality maybe maybe a little less than that but really really good looking so yeah fantastic game really enjoying it so far and, and definitely going to be sticking with that one that sounds interesting i'm not gonna lie as soon as you started describing a god game in vr all i started thinking was oh do you know what the guys who made like reigns or something like that i'd love to see them take on a vr god game and not like like the old style god games like populous or anything like that but one where you're this um you're god and you get all these problems happening down below you you can see them all happening like real time and you can choose to intervene on certain ones and use it like and you can choose to do things like you said like you, i don't know maybe you see a well beached and you can like use your godly powers to get people to save the well or you can just let it die that's what i want to see from a god game now i want someone to make a god game in the vein of reigns but more open and allow you to be more evil an evil god if only there was a name for an opposite of God, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, what, like black and white, you mean? Are you thinking of black and but, white? No, see, black and white lacked it, it touched on it, but sort of just, literally just more, just narrow down that gameplay, narrow it down to literally set piece after set piece, all happening at once, if you need to, and you've got to make your decisions, and you go, I am going to save you from that car crash. I am going to let you die from drowning. Kind of just literally those sort of things, but have it then have a, a, an effect on what happens to the world. I mean, black and white seems a lot more hands-on with how it done things, but a, definitely a build-up from that. It's, it works in my head. Just, just leave it to that. It works in my head. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So there are a few... Um, there's nothing that like you quite like you describe, but there's some that are similar. So I think there's um, a dinosaur management, you know, Jurassic Park ripoff game in VR, but I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, I just remember somebody reviewing it on a podcast that yeah. was <laughs> a while ago. I have a podcast uh, that might have bits of that, and obviously Paper Beast, which is my game of the year, has a lot of god game aspects to it. So if you're looking for some aspects of it that's definitely one to go for because it's amazing yeah um ghost giant does have some of that as well it's all around you and one little guy you know that you're looking after and it's very much pitched towards kids but there's still a lot of manipulating the environment sort of stuff with that um so those are the ones i'd recommend if you want to have that kind of like taken sort of far away that step away from the action where you're just like the puppet master that's kind of those three are sort of in that ballpark to start with and there's probably more but i they're not really generally my type of game but it works well in vr so they are out there so yeah i'll, I'll dig around and have a look as well interesting yeah so just to move on um i'm gonna i've been playing a couple of bits on my switch actually just to get it out of the way i've played an on one two three, four different versions of tetris this week as well um, that's 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 your weekly Tetris update. That's on the low end for you, I think. To be fair, there are only four out at the moment. I haven't got a Game Boy version, an original Game Boy version at the moment, which is a shame. Um, ah, now, yeah, I'm going to break in for a minute because I have a little anecdote. So, for my wife's birthday, which is on the seventh, I upgraded her old Game Boy Advance SP. Ooh. So because <laughs> she plays it all the time I had to wait for her to go to bed and then do it and uh, rapidly at like 11 o'clock at night I was soldering and pulling cases apart and all sorts so what I did was I put a brand new um, IPS screen 
if you if you remember the old screens are, are rubbish especially the the yeah. oldest oldest um, and mine my sp is the oldest oldest um so i put the new ips screen in and it looks gorgeous it's really really great and yeah, what i've what i did to sort of partly test it out was um stick tetris in there as well so i do have the original 1989 Tetris cartridge. So I've been, I have actually been playing Tetris this week on the original, one of the original versions. Nice. See, we've got it on a Bit Boy. Oh, uh, that's that's. So we've got a Bit Boy with a, I think it's got maybe a 16 gig card in it. I don't know why you need a 16 gig card in a Bit Boy, and it's loaded up with loads of stuff. And the only thing that gets played on it is Tetris. Oh, I say original Game Boy Tetris because it's not original Tetris, Game Boy Tetris, which my partner will. It's the only version of Tetris she will accept as being actual Tetris. She will not accept any other version, despite the world having moved on and accepting that you can now hold and spin pieces. <laughs> um, she will not deviate from Tetris, um, the Game Boy. Cool. You're a purist. Yeah. There yeah. We yes. What we need is a little um, Tetris update sting. Yeah. Um, to put in every week. Yeah, yeah we do. <laughs> But aside from that, there's a few games I've been playing, but one I really want to talk about, because it bypassed me for a few years, or the variations of it bypassed me. But it was sent to me quite cheaply. Captain Tsubasa, the football game, the anime football ah, yeah. game. Yes. So, have you ever played a Captain Tsubasa? I have not, but I saw the adverts for this, for the latest version, and I have put it on my wish list. And even during Steam sales, it's not dropped lower than about 30 quid. So I was like, no, no. sod that. So I'm not, no, yeah. I was, I, yeah, I had to get rid of a couple of bits to get it, but someone had it for 20 quid. I was like, yeah, I'll have that. Thank you very much. I, I really want to try it. Cool. So essentially, you take football or soccer, if there's any Americans listening, and you take anime and you put them together. The game plays exactly as you would expect a football game based around anime to play um tactics go out the window there's no such thing as actual tactics so you haven't got to worry about sort of like how many people you got in midfield or you know making sure that you don't get overloaded on the one side or, or who's got the most pace you've got your characters and they're in there and you you pass the ball about kind of just to make oh look you need to do that in a game of football so look here's a pass button but it's essentially about building up various different meters and then unleashing pure anime special cutscene shots that will beat the goalie. Um, so you've got one where, you know, you build it up your meter, you take your shot with one of the players, and this huge, massive anime eagle comes out of the like onto the screen above the player. It cuts to all the, like, do you know the anime fighting angles that you get with the speed lines and everything? Yeah, it does yeah. that. He kicks the ball and then the goalie gets his hands on it, but the ball's spinning and it goes through the goalie's hands and continues spinning in the back of the net. Proper anime. Nice. Um, and like you could do moves where you try and go through and go through players. And if you do that in certain degrees, you cut you you trigger these little like cutscenes within the game that happen. So there's one early on where you get caught and there's four players. Um, coming to tackle you and they you kind of get through one but the next couple come and get you and it's just all over the top and in between or even during the games you've got these anime cutscenes that you'd expect in an RPG almost and it's just all over the top overblown but also played seriously so the characters within it all take their football very seriously um and it's it is it's not played for laughs and I think that's some of the best anime where it's made for laughs, but it's not played for laughs. Yes, yeah, yeah. And you get that balance spot on. And it's here. It's it's just, yeah, it works. So I suppose it's in a way sort of like how like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure works in video game form or how you'd expect um, an anime version of Street Fighter to be when you watch it. But it's that then condensed into a football game. And it's just, oh, it, you know, I dare say long-time purists of the series. So I know it's been around for quite a while now. And I know long-time purists will find things that are wrong with this one or aren't as good as what it what, what they know it as. Or I know it is an anime as well. And people who might watch that might go, oh, no, it doesn't do this properly. But for me, going into it for the first time, 
Oh my word, it's beautiful. It is absolutely sublime. And it's just crazy. It's insane. And I've more than had 20 quid's worth of out, out of it already. There's two stories. So you've got the Captain Tubasa story. And then there's a new hero story. You can do one-off games. Um, and it's online. You can fully edit it. There's just loads of stuff with it. And it's, yeah, a cracking little title. Oh, awesome. You've said everything that you've just said about it was everything that I hoped that game would have in it. So that's really cool. That's the why why I got interested in it. So it sounds as though yeah. the trailer for it has like captured the game perfectly, which is, you know, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. So yeah, now I'm gonna have to so play it. The, yeah. the one caveat I will add to it is the first bit when I first started playing it, I still do it occasionally now. I try and play it like I'm playing like a FIFA or a Pro Evo where I'll get into a good position and I'll take a shot that would usually be a goal. Um, so you could get, find yourself free, like inside the box, and just put as much power on it as you want. And usually in a game of football, even in real life, that'd end up in the back of the net because of like the angle and the space you've got. Do it here if you haven't built up your meter enough. The goalie's saving it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you shoot it. The goalie's saving it. But because it's it's not scripted. But the idea is you're building up these these meters. And it's not just like, oh, you haven't built this meter up to 100%. It's only at 99%. You kind of, it all flashes when you've got the right bits going to pull off the special move. But you need to build it up to get the special move to score. So goals are special. Um, and it, it does all that. But you can't play it like a normal football game. You need to get your head around that side of it first. Awesome. Yeah, sounds really cool. And from the... the great to I don't like having to cover this because we like talking about video games and the positiveness that they bring and and how good they can be for people but unfortunately with every big release it brings out the pond scum Um, I think even that's a too good a name for some of these people who just can't accept that some people don't like their favourite thing um, it's not even a case of not liking their favourite thing when some people are actually trying to help save lives over their favourite thing they don't like it so Cyberpunk 2077 ignoring all the the crunch issues and the you know the social political issues that are kind of being glossed over well, well so we are going to talk about those properly another time once it's all settled down however um, I think Game Informers and I'm going to butcher her name but liana rupert spoke about epileptic seizures um she was potentially having through playing the game and that there was no warnings raised it as just a just a bit of a you know a public service announcement just like if you're going to play this just be aware i was triggered by some epileptic um episodes cyberpunk went yeah okay fair enough uh well cd project red sorry went fair enough we'll make sure there's a warning in there but it is in the eula but you also make a joke that no one reads them in the EULA. So, you know, maybe a bit more front and centre. Uh, she said she loves the game, uh, but just be aware there are epilepsy issues. That should be the end of that. It should be. But utter scum. Just pure scum. And I don't like using that word on a lot of things. I say it's, it's saved for your Kelvin McKenzies and sons of the world. But utter scum uh, were tweeting her videos that were designed to cause epileptic seizures to her Twitter. Disgusting. Um, it's assault. I hope they've all been reported. And I hope they do get charged to the full extent of whatever their country's law is. Because it's disgusting that they've done that. I'm not going to condone doing it if someone had a different, like, really hated your game that you really like and hated it. I'm not going to condone that. But I get why some people might act like that. It's wrong and it's still scummy, but I get it. But when someone, all they're doing is going, look, just, just be careful when you play the game because you don't want to have a fit. So then try and cause them harm to potentially kill them is essentially what they're trying to do with these videos. No, that, that that's just... I despair when it comes to fandom at times. I really, really do. I don't get it and I, I don't even know what to say with, with regards yeah. to it to sort of like to, to finish that off. I'm just yeah. lost 
for words. It's disgusting. It is astonishing, isn't it? And it's it's right that there's assault charges. Um, you know, there's a, there's a route down the legal path to get people for this, but so difficult to enforce um, and really difficult to track. Even though it's online, it's, it's really difficult to make a case for it. And I think again, I think it's partly down to you know being part of a patriarchy and and um, sort of fundamentally misogynistic society because it's often women who experience this female reviewers more than male yes. and so it's treated as a lesser crime as and of lesser importance when they're targeted so that's part of it as well so it, it's all a disgraceful bundle of stuff and i think one thing that would help would be if the community itself was much more vocal like we're being now much more vocal around it and much more critical and just not allowing it to be a thing and not accepting it so people just get yeah. you know completely shut down and um you know just forgotten about and ignored if they if they behave in that kind of a way towards people who are do- doing this as a career and trying to be impartial and the outlets as well don't be scared about not getting your review copy for crying out loud so what if you don't get your review copy because you've had to call out the absolute worst behaviour, whether it's behind the scenes in the like within the game development or whether it's the fans and the communities, and you don't get your 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 next review copy from that publisher, so bloody be it. There are so many other games out there, and if we all actually stood firm and went that this isn't acceptable and we are going to call it out all over the place, it wouldn't happen the publishers wouldn't hold all the cards the toxic communities wouldn't hold all the cards um because what happens is they play to those communities you know the communities kicked up a fuss about the bugs and everything that were in the game and yes all of a sudden they started refunding like ps4 base and xbox one base versions of the game you know and it's they do listen but we as a whole we challenge the wrong things yeah and it is, it, yeah, it, I despair. I, I really do. And I think you're right. I think it's because she's a woman. Yeah. I think that, that's her part and parcel of it as well. Women can't dislike our game. Yeah, yeah. It, it all ties in. It all ties in. It's it's very, It's you can kind of be on the outside and go, oh God, look at all of these, look at all these problems. Where do we start? How do we track them down? How do we deal with them? Who do we educate? But actually, it's it, it often just comes back to, you know the same things which is you know big business exploiting us and the fundamental sort of horror and nastiness of being in a patriarchy and yeah i think thankfully there are changes towards it but there really needs to be more organization around punishing companies and i'm looking you know i am looking at cd project red for this uh, around this kind of behaviour because they've they've courted controversy and yes. discord and all of this sort of thing to, to develop a rabid fan base that will then protect them from criticism once you know they release a product that is not fit for use uh, so yeah yeah and it comes in as well it's i mean i watched the game awards or the game adverts as it's it's correctly dubbed last week and I enjoy it for what it is. You know, I want to see a few new trailers. I don't actually care who gets the awards. But when they announced um, Best Direction and they gave it to Naughty Dog for The Last of Us Part 2, knowing they've had, in that development, enough crunch that has sent um, certain members of the staff um, off sick um, and made them hospitalised, had caused major mental health problems, um, and they gave that game Best Direction. And it was just like, that's when I went, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. Um, it was just a loving. It's, you know, it, what what have you got to do now? Um, it's just they wanted to give Last of Us 2 awards. Whereas I know Hades, for example, and I can think of countless other games that you could use. But Hades, the development team behind that, they actually delayed it when it was needed. Um, it took longer to come out. And, you know, people were making sure they were getting their holidays, the time they needed to get the game right without without risking their health and that gets ignored um yep. because he wants to give it to neil Druckmann and his mates um i i i don't know it is always i, I, I don't know yeah it's, it's always incredible how 
places, outlets or developers or publishers who are not part of, initially, who are not part of the establishment and seem like they're the rebels, turn as soon as they're getting money, as soon as they see yeah. the profit margins that could be made from being exploitative, the way that they turn just so that they can be part of that institution or form one of their own, you know. Yeah. And it's happening It's happened with the Game Awards, it's happened with all... Ev- everything about gaming originally started as a fairly... A punk is probably a strong term, but it was certainly a kind of indie endeavour right at the start and in a short time comparatively 30 years or so yeah. it's turned into you know like the Premier League it's just become uh, a, a club an exclusive club that prices people out and excludes people of colour and uh, you know LGBTQ people and yeah it's it's very very disappointing and sometimes very upsetting yeah, as I said, if you want to give The Last of Us 2 game of the year, because, you know, it is a, a fantastic game by all accounts. I've still not got around to playing it yet myself. Uh, but if you want to give it game of the year, fine. Because, yeah, I still think, that, you know, in some degrees you can separate the politics and the um, and what goes into making a game from the final product. Um, because I think if you look that deep into anything, you'd find ways of going, oh, crap, okay, I can't play this now because they done this or this person doesn't agree with me here. I get separating it. But when the award <laughs> is literally about the best direction, about how the game was made, no. That that is just that is just shitting on on the whole idea of making it make a fair working conditions. It is just shitting on those that do it right, and then you're saying to people, "Well, why bother? Why bother doing it the right way?" Um, yeah. Sickening, disgusting, and screw Jeff Keighley, screw the AAA publishers, and screw what that market is becoming because it's getting worse and worse and worse. I still hold out hope that Devolver Digital will continue to be the shining light that they are. Um, but as you said, you see it time and time and time again. Those that do start off as the rebellious ones, the ones who meant to be the shining light, get caught up in it and they're part of the cesspool. But please, Devolver, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I call that Devolver then because they've got nothing to do with any of this, but I, I, I do like them and I think they do a great job. Um, <laughs> so. but yeah, there are good examples out there, thankfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, but that's, that's probably not getting any major AAA games to review for free. But there you go. Nah, yeah, Sodom. We I don't care. <laughs> we, wasn't, we, we wasn't getting any anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not losing anything. <laughs> no. Um, so, to move on, um, it's a short, short probably second part. And this comes from something that occurred to me this week. A question that came up last night um this could be any time but last night before this we record this me and my partner started watching umbrella academy and up pops the name of ellen page on the opening credits and it started a discussion which was ellen page has now transitioned to elliot page and will be referred to as Elliot Page, and he will make his films and TV shows moving forward, and will be part of season three of the Umbrella Academy, which is going to be interesting to see how they handle that within the the law of the of the comic, or how the comic books work, and how the TV se- series will work. Uh, that's going to be interesting. But then it got us to thinking: is how do you refer to? the previous roles of Elliot Page. Do you refer to um, Ellen Page's excellent turn in Juno? Or is that Elliot Page's excellent turn in Juno? And do you talk about, you know, any awards? I I don't know if as Ellen Page Academy Awards were won, but is it Academy Award winner Ellen Page and now... Elliot Page, or is it Academy Academy Award winner Elliot Page still? Because he's still the same person, but they are just it's a, a you know identifying as Elliot Page now. And we was talking about it, and we got to the point of going, um, "How do you raise these questions? You know, do not, they seem like idiotic questions almost?" But I think it's fine to ask these questions and to ask them publicly. Because Elliot Page, I, I, as far as I'm aware, and please, please feel free to correct me on this, 
is the first major star to transition definitely from female to male. Um, yeah. We know there are actors out there that have transitioned the other way. And I'm going to say, I'm going to be really bad here and completely forget the name of the the actress, but the one who was in Orange is the New Black and puts in a fantastic turn there. But I don't think we've ever seen one go from female to male who has been such a high profile star. Yeah. And what has been really nice is how well it's been accepted. The reports, at least 90% of the reports I saw came out. I mean, it took me a couple of seconds to realise who they were talking about because all the reports went, um, the Umbrella Academy's Elliot Page has come out as transgender. And I just went, who the hell was Elliot Page? And I looked at it, I went, oh, right, okay. So it was good to see that they referred to Elliot Page as Elliot Page and not Ellen Page has done whatever. It was good to see. Yeah. And I only went into detail in the articles. Absolutely brilliant. Shows how far we're moving forward. But it does, there are questions. And the only way to move the conversation forward and to make it normal, and it's something we do with mental health, is to ask the questions. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Don't be the the stupid ones. But I honestly think it's legitimate to ask someone who's come out as gay or pan or anything like later in life and go, well, what changed? Can you be gay without actually having had sex? Can you have heterosex and still and still have um, prefer men? Um, you know, there are are these questions there. Ask them because they are legitimate questions. Um, and it allows people to then look into themselves a lot more. And I don't think it's insulting to ask Elliot Page how he would like to be referred to when it comes to past roles. And how, how do you refer to, when you're speaking to Elliot Page, how do you refer to past roles or or anything like that? And it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, do, do other people have questions that they feel they can't ask or why they feel they can't ask those questions? And it's the same with mental health. I've had people so still do the whole, and I know we get a bit uppity at times when people go, oh, you're in a good mood, so, oh, you can't be that, you can't be that depressed. And they not understand, but ask how I can be in a, how I can come across like I'm in a good mood, um, or I'm happy and jokey. Ask why I can do that, because I'm quite happy to talk about it. It's, it's not asking questions that's the problem, it's the assumptions people make that are the problems. Completely. And the yeah. more we ask questions, the better it will be for everyone. Um, yeah. I, I don't I, know what my, my point is, so I'm going to move <laughs> on to let you respond. Well, cool, yeah, no, I was going to say <laughs> that I, I, you've made the right choice immediately because you've referred to Elliot as, as he and him, which is great. And I'm sure that though starting with those pronouns is the most important thing, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm no expert, so please do correct me, you know, if I'm wrong. People out there want to correct me. But I also think that it ch obviously changes from person to person. So mm. one of my best friends is a trans man, and I always refer to him as him, he and him. But I have heard his partner refer to him as they, and I'm not entirely sure whether I should actually be switching to just always using they and them rather than he and him, because that's a really personal choice for trans people. Very, yes. very personal choice for them. And you do, you have to, there's no way that you're ever going to know. So you know that um, it's not cool to dead name them and it's not cool to say uh, her uh, because, you know, they're, they're not a woman, they're a man. But you don't know whether they that person prefers certain pronouns once they've transitioned, and so yeah, you've got you've got to ask. And I think the thing is that, like you say, people don't mind the question; they pr they prefer questions over ignorance. As long as you're not making those questions, like you say, just to to insult and, and hurt somebody. If it's a genuine question, it it's really good. And I think with with uh, with Elliot Page, I would always start by like if I met him, which is never going to happen. I'd love to because he's I think he's fantastic. But I would start with he, you know he and him. But I would say, uh, is it okay? Are those pronouns all right? And I would ask about uh, what about your previous successes do you want to be referred to as ellen page with those or is it cooler to just you know talk about them in the in the present and 
because there's no right an- no right or wrong answer except from that person's lips. Correct, and it's um, just to carry on from that. Or, or it's when you meet someone who's called, let's say, Philip. And, and you you sort of get to them and go, you, you will quite happily turn around to him and go, is it Philip or Phil? What what do you prefer? You, we will say that all the time because you're like, someone goes, oh no, I prefer Phil or you're okay, call me Phil or whatever, something like that. We do that. And that's something we've always done. Um, and But then I've said before when I've, I know people of Indian descent, Pakistani descent, who their birth name is awkward to say in the Western tongue. Um, because it's it, the way it flows together, you just struggle to say it. So, I mean, I, I had a friend whose name I, I, I really couldn't pronounce it when I was younger, and he just turned around and went, Call me Max. Um, and that's what he went through, Max, because he was aware that his name wasn't e- easy to say for people who weren't used to saying it or, you know, used to names like that. And again, it was fine. So we went, are you sure you're okay with Max? We can try and learn. He was like, no, 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 Max is fine. Honestly, it's easier. It's quicker, he went. I was like, okay, that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's it's the same. And um, what you need to get un- understand as well, and I think this needs to come from the people themselves as well. If a mistake is made, and we'll use Elliot Page at the moment. If I went up to Elliot Page and I accidentally referred to Elliot Page as Ellen, would be, and I feel like I'm calling out Elliot Page, and I'm just, again, it's just an example because it, it's the one we're talking about. Yeah. Um, oh, what's that fast show sketch where he goes, if I met, I could be like, oh, no, that. It's like, but anyway, if I met Elliot Page and I accidentally called him Ellen, I don't want Elliot Page to then turn around and start calling me out as being transphobic or anything like that. Going, oh, dare you, my name. It's to go, just to go, sorry, just to remind you, it is, it is Elliot. If you, I, I get that you've got to get used to it, especially this early on. Um, yeah. But just just to remind you, I was like, oh, right, yeah, no, sorry, that's my bad. Um, as I say, with, I mean, they, them, the only reason I struggle with that is she and her, he and him sound singular, whereas they and them sound plural, and my brain can't cope with that. Yeah. The, the, they and them sounds plural, and I, 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 that's my biggest struggle. Not nothing to do with gender identification. That is just my big. Can we can we come up with new words rather than they and them? Something that's singular, please. It would be, because yeah. it does my head in. That's the only thing. I just the only issue I have with anything. It's just <laughs> the, the the way we use they and them. It's it's plural. I think it yeah, feels plural. I think it. I think it will go over time. I think that yeah. new a new language will evolve around it. Unfortunately, uh, you can never really mandate it. It has to just happen naturally. So we're kind of stuck um, with with that because yes, I, I I don't like using it because you know my my brain is wired now to think of that as a very dismissive thing where you know nothing about them. But um, yes, uh, but yeah, but a lot of trans people actually don't feel like that. So uh, that's a hard one to get to wrap my brain around. But- yeah. Quite, quite amusingly, we was talking about it. Um, I say last night in the in the open. I mean, it took us about twenty minutes to watch the opening thirty seconds of um, of the Umbrella Academy <laughs> because we was chatting about it. I was talking about, about the whole how Elliot Page will be referred to, and I went, it'd be interesting to see how um, the creators deal with it and how how they'll change how they'll change it in the future. She went. I thought you was open. I went, what? She went, I thought you was quite open-minded. I went, yeah. She went, you just refer to it, uh, refer to Elliot Page, is it? And I went, no, I never. I mean, it as in the product. I mean, I wasn't talking, I wasn't saying it about Elliot Page. <laughs> yeah. She went, I did wonder, because like, you're always quite good with that. And I went, no, it as in the product. Will they, you know, are they going to address it as in the overall concept? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, questioning myself going, oh my God, I hope I haven't come across as, oh my, it's just like, um, but again, it just leads to that it's okay. One, it's okay to ask questions. Two, it's okay to make mistakes. If you make a mistake, don't double down on the bloody mistake. That, that's the worst thing. Um, Absolutely. And yeah. yeah, I mean, you will, you may, because I'll try and be quite gender neutral with Edith. And I try not to use terms like good girl and things like that because I think that's um, 
that reinforces gender stereotypes um because the idea of say someone good, good girl good boy is, is definitely submissive anyway and it can cause them to feel that girl you've got to be good girl good boy and it leads to those gender stereotypes yeah so i try to say well done or that's good and things like that but i slip sometimes i've just like edith come here hold my hand edith come on right good girl and i've done it i was like like no try and it happens you do slip and you can't because we're having to change hundreds of years thousands of years worth of ingrained ways of doing things it's going to take time to change um and i get that there's been such a movement with it over the past half a decade where it's become more in the public conscious that those who are lgbtq plus want to see this movement happen i think they're so desperate for it to happen that i don't want to say they're forced it because it sounds like i'm dismissing it but there's the come on let's get this right we're so close let's get this right that they they, there needs to be a step back to go accept that people will make mistakes and then just discuss it when a mistake's made discuss it everyone just needs to be open with each other i say i don't know i i don't want there to be a black community i don't want there to be an lgt lgbtq plus community i don't want there to be communities that are segregated in any way i just want a a community just a community where it does not matter now i know that's not going to happen in my lifetime but that would be the ultimate goal for me that that is what we get but at the moment because i don't like referring to someone like the people in the lgbtq plus community because that feels like i'm being dismissive of okay look this is normal and this is them and that's not what I'm doing, but it's that's how it is all segregated at the moment, which is a shame. And some clever editing can make me seem like a real scumbag then, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Consider it done. <laughs> just want to point out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's um, just open the discussion. I don't know where I stand. You know, I, 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 um, I said before now that I'm, I consider myself non-binary because I don't fit into the stereotypes of gender i don't feel i need to be to change my my gender you know i I don't feel like i was ever a woman trapped in a man's body um i don't feel you know sex my sexual attraction has ever been anything than just what it is you know i find anyone attractive i'm more attracted to i'm in a relation a heterosexual relationship at the moment um, but I'd be open to other things if life had been different and, and, and things like that. But does that put me into the LGBTQ plus community or is that me jumping on something that isn't really for me? And not understand. So it's questions to ask about discovering yourself as well. Yeah. Because I think if we do all look at it at the end of the day, the more we talk, the more open it's all going to become, the more progressive it will become. And at the moment, we can't talk. And that that is a big shame. But it will be better for all of us if we can just talk moving forward and I'll let someone else talk now. (laughs) Wow. But uh, no, I I agree. I agree with what you've said. So yeah, yeah, no, I think it's... uh, As long as we're thinking about these things and talking about them, that's got to be good. Yeah. I'd I'd say, please, um, before I let Stu wrap up, if you've got any comments you want to make, any questions you want to ask, this will be on Twitter, Facebook, wherever, even email us. Ask. Let's, let's, Let's get the conversation going. I would encourage you all to ask whatever questions you might have. As long as they're not insulting, then just come through with it. Yeah, I agree. So, yes, that's it for another week. So, as usual, please, you know, like and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook, where there's a lot of content, like the stuff that Brad described earlier on. If you want to support us financially, then support us on Patreon or drop us some cash on Coffee. And we also have our own Discord, which we use for all sorts of conversation, and you're welcome to join. It's very friendly and covers a lot of topics, so it's very much worth checking out. That's it. So in the meantime, take care and stay safe. Stay safe.